um i'm not gonna waste any time um later these videos i always make sure that they are available on youtube i haven't done lives in a long time so i'm also recording for the purposes of um youtube as well but i want us to discuss something that god has instilled in my heart and that is with regards to seeing things from god's perspective seeing things seeing things from god's worldview um because i think at times we are often discouraged because we don't often see things from god's perspective um we can be short-sighted in our perspective we can be short-sighted in terms of how we perceive things and it's only when we embrace god's world view it's when we embrace god's perspective that we come to a place of true faith faith that's not only able to sustain us but also faith that's able to um increase our our knowledge increase our heart for god increase our devotion and ultimately bear fruit in terms of our faith work so i want us to speak on two scriptures tonight that actually advocate for seeing things from god's perspective the first thing or the first scripture i want us to look into it's a scripture that we find from the book of revelations chapter 4 in the book of revelations chapter 4 this is a revelation about jesus and jesus reveals himself to john the apostle john is the last apostle that is remaining the other 11 have died crucified for the faith um killed horrible deaths for the sake of the gospel and he's the only one god allows to still uh, remain and be able to tell the story about the revelation of jesus and to tell us about what we have come to know as eschatology um the um, the beginning of the end or the relaying about the end of time and we are told that at this point john the revelator is blind and he is stuck or he's situated in the island of patmos and this is the revelation of the son of god and in revelation chapter 4 after god speaks to him or speaks to him or speaks through him to the churches that he has issue with um and continuously says let the ear or let your ears hear what the spirit is saying god gives words of commendation where they are doing well but he also gives words of condemnation where they are not doing well and he also tells them steps they need to take in order to improve and what things they must what things must they employ to ensure that they are able to grow in the lord in revelation chapter 4 after speaking to the churches he says to john after this i looked and behold a door um a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which i had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said come up here and i will show you what must take place after this and this is the this is the glorious thing that god is saying here that after god has shown him the state of churches and where they've been failing and where they need to improve but also where they've been doing well he took him to a different place and he says to him come up here because i will show you what what must take place after this that god said let me borrow you my lenses let me borrow you my perspective let me introduce you to my worldview and when it continues this chapter 4 we learn that john in this moment in time he sees himself in heaven is where he sees the angels around the throne of god the 24 elders worshiping god in his majesty and in his glory and god is saying this is my perspective this is the situ this is the location or this is the position in which i speak this is the environment in which i when i send forth a promise when i send forth a declaration this is the position i find myself in this is the worldview that i often speak from that so many things that are lost within what god is doing in our time and what god is doing in our lives is because sometimes we speak them or we look them or we perceive them from an unfavorable position we are in unhealthy environments while still wanting to be in the environment or in the position that god has called us to that he's saying to john you must be in a heavenly position you must be in a heavenly environment for you to understand mysterious things concerning 
what is still to come that you must be in a position or you must be in an environment where my spirit and my glory affords you the lenses of seeing things directly from my throne that is not that god is not going to do it but the reason why we walk in discouragement is because we are trying to understand what we are going through from a position that is not heavenly from a perspective that is not inspired by god from a world view that is not fully orchestrated and fully led by god so he says look i want you to sh- i want to show you things that are to come but you must come up here first you must remove yourself from the earthly position you must remove yourself from the lowly position you must remove yourself from a discouraged position and you must come to a position which i want you to be in as a result when you are where i am you can be able to understand things concerning what is still to come that the greatest place that affords us the greatest revelation is when we are in the presence of god what affords us to see things from god's perspective is when we are positioned and is when we are where he wants us to be so the first thing he's saying to john in terms of him adopting his perspective him adopting god's world view says come up here come to where i am be removed from your lowly our place be removed from your earthly perspective be removed from your fleshly perspective and come to the heavenly so that i can show you what is still to come i want us to also visit the book of ephesians chapter 3 and this is now something that paul also adopts and and this is this this should be the 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 the, the perspective or this should be an attitude of a believer to always want to see things from god's perspective to always want to ask ourselves the question what would jesus do in this situation it's a, it's a glorious thing for us to always want to aspire to achieve how would christ respond to this question how would god want me to act in this moment what is the holy spirit prompting me to do am i grieving the holy spirit by the reaction that i'm giving or am i actually glorifying the holy spirit that should always be our question before we react before we are discouraged before we try to fight our own battles before we want to do things our own way we must always ask ourselves this crucial question am i grieving the holy spirit by doing this or am i actually glorifying the holy spirit by doing this now i want us to look at Philippians chapter 3 verse 8. Now, this is Paul speaking to the church of, of of Philippi and I want us to start from verse 8 and he says indeed I count everything as loss. And this is how he's starting. He says indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He's saying look, everything that I know, every achievement that I have, every milestone that I have achieved and remember Paul was he considers himself the Pharisee of the Pharisees he considers himself a Jew he considers himself a Hebrew Paul remember he was a scholar he was one of the Sanhedrin he was a respected man in his time he was even the person behind the stoning of one of the first um martyrs in the bible whose name was Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7 Paul was there Paul was very prominent Paul was very influential he even says that he was schooled under the teachings or under the school of Gamaliel if you read the book of Acts Gamaliel was also one of the influential teachers of the day he was one of the most influential pharisee of the day and Paul having all this knowledge all this prominence all this importance he says when i compare all of those things with the knowledge of Christ with the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my lord he says i consider all of that a loss that it is the perspective of seeing Jesus for who he is his glory his might his power and knowing him fully and truly and truly as well that everything else will seem like a loss all of a sudden the things that we fix our eyes on that we are so fixated upon all of a sudden they become a loss because of the introduction we have come of knowing the son the introduction of knowing Jesus when we come face to face with Jesus everything all of a sudden becomes a loss and this is how Paul starts or he speaks to the church he says when i compare the knowledge of Christ everything i have achieved thus far i count it as loss he says for his sake i have suffered the loss of all things and i count them as rubbish in order that i might gain Christ he says if i were to choose everything else i consider it as rubbish if 
it means it stands in the way of me gaining Christ. This was Paul's worldview, that everything else is a loss if I do not have Christ. That I can, ho- I can have all the riches in the world, I can have all the, the followers, all the people loving me, all the, 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 co- the, the commendable words, you know, the money, the job, all of those things I can always achieve. But if they come in the expense of Christ, he says, I'm at a great loss. He says, if I were to compare this with gaining Christ, he says, I consider all of those things as rubbish. Nothing worthy to pursue. So this is our worldview. This is the worldview we must always try to adopt. This is the worldview that we must always try to attain. Gaining Christ above all things. That it must always be first Jesus, then everything else follows. We must not be in a position or be in a place where Jesus in our lives is competing with other external things. The eternal God competing with temporary things of this world. We should never come to that place in our relationship with Christ. Christ who has the power to give us eternal life must always be a priority because he's the one who has the keys to eternity. And everything else in this world, no matter how beautiful it is, no matter how spectacular it is, it all has an expiry date. Upon our death and at times even while we're still alive, there are certain things that we won't always attain or we won't always have in our position, even in this life. But even if we might have them until we die guess what at the t- at the date of our um, of our death all of those things all of a sudden do not matter our qualification all of those things they do not matter because every single thing except christ has an expiry date so when paul looks at all of these things he says look if i were to choose eternity and what's temporary i consider every single thing temporary to be nothing but loss and rubbish when it comes in comparison with gaining christ and in verse 9 he says And I want to be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, verse 10, look at this. He says, that I may know him. This is is, is his obsession. This is his desire. This is his ultimate goal, to know him. The greatest thing we can have in this world is to know Jesus. The greatest attainment, the greatest achievement you can ever have in this life is to know him. Paul says that I might know him, not only know him, but also know the power of his resurrection. There's there's actually something beautiful behind what he's saying. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, If Christ is not risen from the dead, or if Christ is not risen, then me and you are still dead in our sins. He says, what is attributed to me and you gaining salvation, what ultimately makes me and you free from the con- free, be free from the contamination and the penalty of sin is the resurrection of Christ. He says, therefore, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, then me and you are still dead in our sins. And that's why he says, I want to know him, not only him, but also the power of his resurrection. Because guess what? It is the power of his resurrection that makes me and you a believer. If Jesus died and was not risen again, then me and you were never going to come to a place where our sins are forgiven. It's because he had to defeat the grave. He had to defeat sin and its chains so that he ultimately brought us to a place where we are also alive with him. Paul says, when he died, we died with him. But when he was resurrected, guess what? We are also resurrected with him. What was going to be the point of us dying with him for all eternity no 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 when he died yes we died with him but when he resurrected that's when we also found new life when the old man died but the new man in us through christ came about so paul says i don't only want to know him but i also want to know the power of his resurrection because because paul says if jesus christ is not risen from the dead it means me and you are still dead in our sins and if me and you are still dead in our sins and our hope is only in this life he says we are the we are most to be pitied in terms of the people in this world he says christians are the most to be pitied if christ did not rise from the dead and if he did not rise from the dead and actually promise us and usher us into eternal life and we're only subjected to all the benefits and the good things of this world he says look our faith is futile our faith is in vain and we are to be most pitied but guess what he was he rose from the dead he resurrected from the dead and as a result paul even echoes these words that one of the things that will bring us to a place where we understand christ fully and we adopt his perspective is when we embrace the power of the resurrection is when we fully understand and we fully submerge ourselves and we fully meditate upon the events that took place when 
Jesus rose from the dead and what, what that meant for us as the church. And Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and I may share in his suffering. Paul says this is the biggest blessing of them all to be able to share in the sufferings of Christ. Many of us Unfortunately, in our Christianity today, we don't always emphasize about the beauty and the glory that comes when we share in the sufferings of Christ. When we partner with Him, even in His suffering. That when we walk boldly in our faith, when we say things that people are scared to say, when we contend for the faith, when we defend the faith, when we are willing to be um, ridiculed for the faith, when we are willing to be rejected for the faith, when we are willing to be deplatformed for the faith, when we share in his sufferings, Paul says this is a beautiful and glorious thing. He says, I want to also know that part, to share in his suffering, because this is what ultimately makes me a believer. Becoming like him even in his death, that by any means possible, I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, this is a very glorious um, observation Paul makes here. And I want us to be in a place where we fully meditate on this. That the greatest achievement, the greatest position we can ever position ourselves in is when we fully are devoted to Christ, is when we are fully after Him, is when we seek Him in all His splendor, in all His beauty, in all His glory. It's when we see things from His perspective. It's when we adopt His worldview. It's when we see things from through his lenses it's when we adopt his mindset it's when we we, we 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 take also upon ourselves that mind that was in christ paul even says that that we must also take upon ourselves that mind that was in christ it's when we do all of those things that we can come to a place where even in unfavorable seasons in our lives even in discouraging seasons in our lives we will never be discouraged because we see things from god's perspective god's perspective does not only see the beginning and the present but he also sees the end he knows eternity past he knows the present he also knows eternity to come so when we adopt the mindset of christ we are people who walk with the hope of eternity to come that yes things might not go well for me at this point in time but guess what this won't always be the case there's a joy that will come in the morning there will be a time of rejoicing where there won't be any weeping there won't be any pain there won't be any distress but there will be joy for the joy of the lord is my strength that's when we now adopt the worldview of god is when we walk in the promises of god to say lord this is what you have said concerning my life that you know i'm 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 i'm, I'm not the tail i'm the head that the enemy has no hold over me that he is under my feet that you have given me authority through your spirit that i cannot be subjected to the principalities of this world but you have given me power through the Holy Spirit. For you say, we shall, for you say, Lord, we shall receive power and the Holy Spirit come upon us. These are the promises I choose to walk in. It's when you adopt that worldview from the scriptures, what the scriptures sell to you, what the scriptures tell you about who God says you are, what God says about the position you are in, what God says about you being a Christian, the power, the benefits, the advantages you have as a child of God, is when you adopt all of those truths, is when you see things from God's perspective, is when you absorb the scriptures, is when you meditate on the scriptures, that you won't walk as unbelievers, that you won't walk as those who are without hope, that you won't walk as those who are without a messiah that you don't walk as those who don't have a master who watches over them the bible says jesus even when we are discouraged and don't know what to pray for he constantly maketh intercession for us he constantly brings our name before the father so this is our hope so if all fails always put yourself in a place in this moment in time what would god want me to do what would best give glory to god Will me being in this depressive mode and staying in it and building this wall of defense and rejecting people and not wanting to be in fellowship with believers and not wanting to go to that prayer meeting and not wanting to go to those people, those believers who bring me up, who inspire me, who inspire the hunger, the zeal in me. You know, Are you going to entertain that or are you going to adopt what God says about you to say you must be in the gathering of believers. You must be with your fellow brothers and sisters. 
guess what the enemy does this to everyone the bible says for the enemy is always constantly roaming around like a lion seeking those he can devour and peter says this is happening throughout the world to your brothers and sisters so sometimes we have this idea that i'm the only one who's facing this thing i'm the only one no one will ever understand me and this is what the enemy wants you to think because he thrives in isolation the best tool the best bet he has against you is that you do things alone that you live in isolation he wants you to think there's no hope you are alone no one understands everyone around you is false he wants you to be in that place of despair to be in that place of um, um, isolation as a result he can be able to kill you in that place i mean we also see this with lions um, with with lions especially animals as well that animals are often better protected when they walk in packs that whenever one is actually removed from the pack it actually becomes vulnerable to the, the to, to, to the other animals that may want to devour it that's why they must always be in a pack a young elephant must always be in the pack of other bigger elephants. A younger buffalo must always be in a pack of older buffaloes. Because guess what? In that pack, there's hope. They are not as vulnerable as they could. They are not as susceptible to any form of attack as they would if they were alone. So the enemy also doesn't want you to fellowship with believers, to be in church, to go to those prayer meetings, to be to be around other young Christians. Why? Because he wants you to be alone. He wants you to see things from this lowly, earthly, fleshly perspective, this social media perspective, and not fully embrace the perspective of God that says, look, you've been crying about this, but guess what? I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to set you free. You've been in chains for too long. I'm going to set you free because guess what? The chains that you are having, the, the cry, the sickness, the sufferings you're experiencing today, the Bible tells us that this won't always be the case. That God, when he sets us free, he sets us free indeed. That where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So this is the perspective of God. That we should see things from the lenses of the spirit of God. Whenever we are faced with situations, whether good or bad, always ask yourself, how best can I glorify the Holy Spirit in this? Am I going to stay in this rut? Am I going to stay in this pain and misery? Or am I going to rejoice in the Lord? Even though I know it's bad, but I'm going to look at God and say, because you are good, this thing that is bad does not define me. Because guess what? Even in the bad situation, we still serve a good God. That should be our perspective. That should be the worldview we adopt. So I wanted to encourage you, this has been something that has been speaking to me. I've been in a place where I've not been feeling well. I've been sick here and there. And God has been just encouraging me, saying, look, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. And guess what? I'm actually thankful for the season of me not feeling well because there's so many things I learned. There's so many things I had to change concerning my life. There's so many things that I had to do away with. And there's so many things I had to embrace. But guess what? I was not going to be in this position if that season of sickness did not come in my life. Just like Job. Job was not going to be in a place where he fully appreciates God if he was not tested with God removing everything from him, even plaguing sickness upon him. Because guess what? He realized that, wait, I did not fully understand the maker. It's in that journey, that difficult journey, that he even spoke to himself with his friends to say, this is who God is. No, even before I was born, God knew this thing. How can I be separated from my maker? There are certain things we won't fully understand and comprehend lest we walk in those tough seasons, in those tough trials and tests. What are you going to do in that moment? Are you going to despair and distress? Are you going to ask the question, God, in this moment, in this situation, how best do I glorify you? May God bless you. May God keep you. I did not want to be long. Amen.